as I take my newfound sense of agency, as I take my newfound sense of consciousness, and I am taking these new actions, this is not just for me, but that I have the ability to enable the collective shift to occur. Hello, yogis, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Dharma Talk. I'm your host, Henry Winslow, and this is episode number 58. This week, I interview Melanie Klein. Melanie is a thought leader and influencer, not only in the yoga world, but also in the topics of body confidence, empowerment, visibility, sociology, and women's studies. Melanie is a prolific author and has penned a series of books sharing the perspectives of different yoga practitioners from all different backgrounds, bodies, and walks of life. In this conversation, I speak to Melanie about why she's starting to shy away from the word yoga at this stage of her work and practice, despite the influence it's had over her life's transformation. She shares the breakthrough that she experienced in a quote-unquote advanced class that allowed her to process deeply buried emotional exhaustion. We get into the dangers of social media and a system that lends credibility through the currency of likes and followers. And finally, we end with an empowering message about recognizing personal agency to affect individual transformation and institutional change at once. All of that is coming up very soon. Please just stay tuned through these announcements and we'll dive into my interview with Melanie Klein. This episode is brought to you in part by Ohm Men's Yoga Apparel. I love this brand, especially their two dogs shorts and the Dharma pants because, well, they've got a great name, but also they're lightweight, flexy, stretchy, and really stay out of your way in your practice in the best way possible. And right down to the ethos of their brand, Ohm is all about conscious movement in and outside of the mat. They aim to minimize their impact on the environment by using recycled fabrics, which is really great. And ultimately, it's all about getting more men out of their heads and into a consistent movement practice to help them live life to the fullest. So here's the deal. Ohm is giving you 15% off your order if you use code dharma15 at checkout. So that's om, O-H-M-M-E dot com. Use code dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A 15 for 15% off your order. Guys, take advantage of this. Get a pair of shorts, some pants, maybe a t-shirt. You're going to love it. Now for the teaching calendar. On June 1st, I'll be leading a backbending workshop at Yoga to the People in Brooklyn. On June 22nd and 23rd, I will be giving a weekend of workshops at Yoga to the People St. Mark's in Manhattan. First one on arm balancing, second one a purification practice with mantra, pranayama, and kriya. In July and August, I'll be helping out with the 300-hour teacher training at Lighthouse Yoga School. For that one, be sure to enter code HENRYWINS on your application to save $100 on the tuition. And then October 25th through October 27th, Veronica and I will be leading a weekend of workshops in Bucerias, Mexico. Please join us for any or all of these events. The details are at henrywins.com slash events. What's your purpose? What's your vision? What mark will you leave on this planet long after you're gone? I'm Henry Winslow, and you're listening to Dharma Talk, the only podcast where I interview inspirational yogis on how they're changing the world in their own unique ways. Whether you're still searching for your purpose or already walking the path, I hope these stories get you excited to live your dharma. Hello, Dharma Talk community, and welcome back to another episode. Today, I have Melanie Klein on the line. Melanie is a thought leader and influencer in the areas of body confidence, authentic empowerment, and visibility. She is also a successful writer, empowerment coach, speaker, and professor of sociology and women's studies. She has published several books on yoga and body image and how this intersects with social justice. 
She co-founded the Yoga and Body Image Coalition in 2014 and is the co-founder of The Joy Revolution with her partner, Mark Cordon. Melanie, thank you so much for coming on Dharma Talk today. I'm excited to have this opportunity to talk to you. How are you today? I'm great, Henry. Thanks so much for having me. Well, we always start with the same uh, opening question, which I think will be a nice way to get into all of these things that you're working on. That question is this, what does the word Dharma mean to you? And what is your Dharma as you understand it today? For me, Dharma has always been sort of walking the path, walking the path that specifically is authentic and unique to me and the service that I have um, really to do in the world. And so when I think about that word, I think about just coming into my own yoga practice and how that merged with my sociological imagination and my feminist consciousness that were blooming right around the same time and how it became very clear to me very quickly that the work that I'm currently doing and have been doing was the work that I was supposed to be doing. In fact, uh, I felt deeply compelled or drawn to do that and have continued to do that despite challenges, obstacles, and even times when it would seem to uh, be a lot easier to quit, if that makes sense, because it can become overwhelming, it can become lonely, it can become arduous. So for me, uh, you know, Dharma is about really being true to that particular path that is called for you and walking that path in full integrity. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you came into your yoga practice around the same time that you were already doing some of the work that has since been empowered by your yoga practice, the sociological work, and as you put it, feminist consciousness work. What did that look like before yoga? And what does it look like now that yoga is more woven into the fabric of what you're doing? Well, you know, I, this was about around 1994 that I sort of walked into my first sociology of women's class and uh, really that sort of sense of awareness around what my life looked like and what my experiences had been, how they were couched within the larger social frameworks was a really illuminating and eye-opening one for me, which compelled me to go deep into action to begin to change those structures because I felt that you know, based on my own insecurities from being in toxic relationships, mentally, emotionally abusive relationships, to disordered eating, to having just a really low sense of self-esteem and seeing how that was really part and parcel of a larger, you know, patriarchal culture in which girls and women saw themselves primarily as objects, you know, and not uh, really agents of their own let's say dharma or you know their own sense of self i wanted to go into that action and do things but all of that action was really informed by an intellectual understanding of these things which was powerful and incredibly liberating but there were certain limitations because when i started to think about well how else could i feel how else could i be how else could i show up in the world you know, all I had to go back to were the ways that I felt and the ways that I would show up based on those experiences I had up until that point. And when my yoga practice came into play, it was a real opportunity to practice new ways of being, new ways of showing up by first and foremost coming into the present moment and beginning to even having a real understanding of what I was feeling and knowing that it was temporary, knowing that I didn't have to react to every single sensation or thought or feeling that came up. So what really happened at that point was my work felt very complete, it felt more um, fully dimensional, that it wasn't just about what I was thinking and feeling, but also how I was being and, um, you know, new ways of sort of looking at that, having a paradigm shift uh, in terms of, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, that self-love is something to aspire to or, you know, to be more compassionate or to be more forgiving, but you don't actually know what that feels like. You don't even know how to practice that. And so my my yoga practice, my meditation practice provided that opportunity. So at that point forward, um, they were just, you know, I couldn't tease them apart. For me, you know, the sociological imagination with its sort of focus on systems, structures, and institutions, and feminist consciousness, and then mindfulness and embodiment were all about, you know, raising consciousness in every way, and then allowing that raise consciousness to create new actions. And so that has been what my work has been infused with, 
you know, for the last 24 years at this point. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that's certainly something that I can relate to wanting to intellectualize things as a, as a, as a tendency, but finally, once you do embody something and feel it at a deeper level, there is a deeper sense of knowing that comes with that. And yoga tends to be a very helpful practice practice for getting out of the mind and into feeling into, as you put it, even being. So what does your yoga practice look like? What do you, what do you consider to be, um, a necessary part of your, of your practice? You know, I love that question. I think it also, I would love to um, approach it with also a sense of what it used to look like, if that makes sense, because Definitely. at this point, you know, I'm in my 40s, I've been practicing for, you know, 23 years that it, it has had so many different vacillations over time. And I'll be quite honest, there's in many ways, I kind of shy away from the word yoga now, which is interesting because so many of my books have yoga in the title. Um, yet the one that I'm working on currently is called Embodied Resilience because I felt like in many ways yoga has been pigeonholed to look a certain way. Yoga bodies have been pigeonholed to look a certain way. And even though that's been part of my work is to deconstruct those stereotypes, I still think that yoga tends to be viewed as very one dimensional in our Northwestern culture. And so yoga for me is much more expansive, yet at the same time, it encompasses just more mindfulness in all of the various ways that that can show up. So when I was a young person, I would go practice with my own teacher, let's say for 90 to 120 minutes of doing, you know, a really strenuous flow, which served me really well in my 20s. And I did that for probably 10 plus years. And now that includes having the mindfulness and meditative state from when I go walking to when I'm in seated meditation, whether I'm doing mantra or visualization to doing some restorative work or having a home practice. So um, I really change it up based on the way that I'm feeling, what I'm needing, and what's really calling to me the most at that time. But it certainly does no, no longer looks like a 90 to 120 minute, minute vinyasa flow like it used to. Right. And, and that flexibility to adjust the practice based on today's needs is itself a form of practice, right? Listening to, to what you're feeling, getting into that sense beyond the intellectualization. Oh, absolutely. And that's the thing that's so ironic is I think I probably practiced with my teacher for five years before I really understood that, meaning that was always part of his, you know, sort of yoga speak, if you will, while we were practicing was, you know, not comparing and competing, not only with others, but not comparing and competing with ourselves, you know, having the understanding that day to day, hour to hour, and definitely year to year, we're, we're changing so much and our needs are going to change. And how can we really use, you know, the poses and the practice is an opportunity to dive into um, having a greater sense of what our body is needing at that moment. And I loved the way that sounded, especially coming from a fitness background and having had issues with disordered eating and, you know, sort of uh, body image issues at large, I really uh, welcomed the sort of new perspective of like, oh, great, I can be gentle with myself. I can be forgiving. I can really listen to what my needs are instead of, you know, trying to fit myself into a certain box. Yet at the same time, I, you know, there were definitely times where my breath was signaling to me that I probably should take a break or maybe that I should uh, modify something or go into child's pose. And yet I didn't. Um, it's like I heard it, but I couldn't quite, um, you know, plug it into my body yet. And so admittedly, that took about five years for me to really, really come to the place where I would allow myself to take a break without beating myself up and feeling like I had somehow failed or, you know, judging myself. So it was it was definitely a slow learning curve for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that I think is a very common internal struggle for a lot of yoga practitioners because we have on the one hand this idea of tapas of of the discipline and the fire and that we should be pushing through the resistance right but on the other hand there is the idea of surrender um which need these two ideas need to be reconciled and that's a struggle 
Yeah. And, you know, for me, one of, I think the most, if there's any measure of success, which is problematic in itself, but when I, I realized that my practice had advanced in some particular way was when I finally allowed myself, I think for about, there was a maybe nine month period where I would uh, go to class as I always did. And like I said, that was about five to six days a week. Um, and it was the quote advanced class. So there was a little bit of pressure just from the name, I think, where I would go into child's pose for, oh, I would say three quarters of the class. And that went on for about nine months in these different cycles. And that was a huge breakthrough for me because, um, it wasn't just that my body was tired in that moment. There was a lot of things that was moving through for me in my body, you know, that was coming out in my psyche and and, in, in my emotions where my body just craved rest. It craved an opportunity to restore. It craved an opportunity to just be. And so for me to continue to come to the practice, so when you're saying reconciling, you know, sort of the discipline with the surrender, that was that moment for me. I still showed up. I went in, into the practice with the people that I had practiced with for many, many years. I didn't just stay home and, and didn't approach the practice at all, but I went in and the way that I went in and where I went during that time um, was very, very new. And it felt like a huge release for me. And it felt like a huge homecoming as well to just give my body a break, to give myself a break and really um, not just say it, <laughs> not just believe it, but to actually do it. That was that moment of like, this is what it looks like. This is not just something that, you know, I can say would be helpful, but I'm actually doing it. And so there was a lot in that particular period of my practice that was very profound for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, and, and to do that in a space where other people are watching is also like the test of the ego. Um, it's one thing to, to push yourself beyond your limits and, and recognize that that's ego, but it, it, it's no less, um, it's no less extreme to be pushing on the opposite end of, of that spectrum between the tapas and the Isvara Pranidana or between the discipline and push and the surrender to show up to class and do things that you shouldn't probably do for your body versus show up and rest the whole time. I'm sure you were probably processing a lot of buried exhaustion that had been ignored for a long period of time. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. And what you said about doing that, you know, showing up in the class while other people were there, I have to admit that, you know, uh, my teacher's morning classes or some of the late evening classes, which were not, quote, advanced and not and, and were open to the public, because at that time, my teacher's advanced classes, you had to ask permission and it was it was never about the physical practices. My teacher wanted to make sure that the people who were going to those classes would actually allow themselves to take breaks and, you know, were able to come into that space. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, there was still a certain association with advance to physicality. And so all of that to say is there was a sort of, you know, you had to go through this gatekeeping mechanism to get into the class and the larger public classes oftentimes were known at that particular period of time of having anywhere from 100, 140 people in it. So, and having a sea of people in those classes, uh, there was this element of like, I felt like I could hide out, like nobody would be paying attention to me. And in the quote, smaller advanced classes, there might be, you know, a third or a quarter of the number of people, yet the space was incredibly large. So there was a sense of, um, that, you know, your presence was more glaring than in the larger class. So for me to, not only go into, you know, a resting pose in a quote advanced class that I still in my mind equated with a certain level of physical prowess, but also in a class where I was more visible was really a huge victory for me yeah. <laughs> because, you know, I get, there would be moments of like, oh God, you know, am I being judged or people like, you know, looking at me and then I had to just let it all go. So it was the exhaustion on the physical level, but also the mental and emotional, all of those years of, you know, trying to maintain certain appearances, trying to live up to certain roles and identities. Um, that was really an opportunity for them to just kind of dissolve yeah. and be released. Yeah, that that is the advanced yoga, at least it was in right. your case at that point, was to go deeper into whatever it is that needed to to heal or process. Absolutely. Can we talk a little bit about um 
about your upcoming book and why you've chosen to, you spoke a bit about this, about resistance around the terminology of, of yoga. I think there's definitely some, um, there's something to be said both for the, in the positive and the negative about yoga growing in the mainstream conversation on the, on the plus side, you know, that carries a lot of benefit and people are being exposed to a practice that has the potential to create a lot of positive fallout. And then on the negative side, as the conversation goes wider, it's like that game of telephone where, um, you know, the, the meaning gets jumbled and, and diluted or misconstrued potentially. And I can see why you would want to just bring the language into, into clearer, uh, spoken word and just talk about what you're talking about. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll answer both those questions. I'll start with the current book. So I, um, my first anthology that I did was with Anna Guest Jelly, the founder of Kirby Yoga. She was sort of the pioneer in that field. And we had come together in about 2011, 2010, 2011. We started blogging for Elephant Journal, actually, at the time. And, you know, came to connect over body image issues and how a consistent yoga practice could be really healing. And so we decided to, you know, our first book was on yoga and body image. And the primary focus was how there was this wonderful transformative component to the practice in terms of really letting go of what it looks like and going into what it feels like and being able to resolve any kind of negative body image issues and kind of being liberated from that. And yet at the same time, you know, yoga culture had already been rapidly changing at this point. We had to also address, well, what are some of the downsides? What are the shadow sides of the practice? And distinguish the practice from the industry and the business of yoga uh, at that particular point. And then that was followed up with Yoga Rising, which um, came out at the beginning of last year, which was kind of getting into the activism component. What what do we do once we have a certain sense of peace and we're liberated from those particular issues? How can we become an agent of change in the world? And so this one that I'm working on right now or that is getting ready to go to the publisher is uh, embodied resilience because I started to notice that there was a big theme that came up in terms of working on the last book there were a lot of stories of grief and sexual trauma and, um, you know, substance abuse issues, dealing with death. And I said, oh, there's another emerging theme. How can we use our yoga practice to really um, allow us to have this resilience in dealing with these incredible challenges that we as humans face in our lifetime, right? And in going back and forth with my co-editors, um, and uh, my my publisher, we just found that you know yoga in many ways is, is just overused. And despite the fact that there have been so many conversations around accessibility and diversity and inclusion and the work that I have specifically done around breaking stereotypes, there is this huge mainstream image that still sees the yoga practice in a very one dimensional way, that sees yoga practitioners in a very one dimensional way, and. I just decided it was time to steer away from that altogether and go into something that was just more inclusive, all encompassing, um, and didn't have, I think to a certain degree, the stigma, the charge and the stereotypical imagery associated with that particular word. Mm -hmm. The baggage. Yeah, the baggage. And, you know, I'll also say, I mean, our, our big hashtag at the yoga and body image coalition was back in 2014, we created the uh, the hashtag what a yogi looks like campaign is to really challenge the idea of the quote yoga body and what yoga practitioners look like. And then we did a few campaigns around hashtag what yoga looks like. So we've done, you know, much of that yet at the same time, you know, I cannot deny that while that conversation has expanded exponentially, on the other hand, we have, you know, just, I don't want to name any names or even companies, but we have just the other track running simultaneously where the the image of yoga is still, you know, continues to be very young, able-bodied, lith, bendy, primarily women um, doing uh, poses that we've actually come to find out cause lots of injury and strain or are, you know, really uh, more aligned with gymnastics or things of that nature. And um, 
I, yeah, I just, I, I just have come to the place where I didn't want to be, I didn't want to have those associations anymore. And I didn't want people who needed this work to be in, in any way, you know, blocked from accessing this because the word didn't resonate with them or they didn't see themselves as being someone who could practice or, you know, has any kind of a turn off to that. Um, I wanted to kind of like zoom out and away from it. Yeah. Yeah. This is interesting. And, and to your point about, um, the, the two parallel conversations happening at once, it's difficult to run the counter narrative when the one that you're talking about trying to work against is backed by, you know, million dollar campaigns. So I, (laughs) I totally appreciate what you're saying. Um, and it makes me think, you know, one of the things I think about often is how asana practice, the physical asana and pranayama, the physical practices associated with the path of yoga are what initially drew me in. But had it not been for those and my initial connection to that, I wouldn't have, well, I can't say I wouldn't, but I wouldn't certainly through the path that I did end up being interested in the rest of the subtler practices of yoga and and being interested in following the the yamas and yamas and getting more interested in meditation and all of these things that help me with my mental well-being. So I wonder in your case with taking the yoga name out and trying to remove the association with the, the asanas that are turning into contortion and gymnastics and the social conversation, are we going to see the reverse effect potentially where you draw people in with some of the other less talked about um, components of a yoga practice and then maybe as the veil is removed and people feel less intimidated they'll be interested in trying some of these things that otherwise might have been off-putting uh it's a great question and and actually there was a few other things that came up so I, as you can see my my answers sometimes tend to get a little bit long and all of nuanced um but bear with me i definitely That's how I heard like your it. question okay good <laughs> good because i, I do want to mention a couple other things sort of as a preamble to that, which is like I said, you know, in the books, I have really made a point of distinguishing between yoga practice, yoga culture, and the business of yoga, because all three things are very, very different. And for me, what has been, you know, the transformative component is the yoga practice. Yoga culture, to a certain degree, has been helpful in having a sense of community and solidarity, Though, like you pointed out, in terms of the millions of dollars of coming in, um, yoga culture at this point really is primarily dictated by uh, large companies. Um, doesn't mean that there aren't the subgroups and the grassroots, you know, happening. It just means that the primary picture uh, of what yoga is comes through that larger filter of our own culture, right? I, I've done a lot of sociological study, you know, from Marx to Horkheimer to Weber to, you know, all of these individuals and pointing out that nothing can exist in the culture that hasn't passed through the filter of a larger culture. So all of that to say is as, as yoga became mainstream, it really was no surprise to me as a sociologist that it began to morph the way that it morphed. And I remember very clearly seeing that happen. So right around, I would say, 1999 to 2004, there was a huge shift that started to occur where I noticed that the advertisements in some of the large yoga magazines started to change. I noticed that the covers started to change. I noticed that the articles and you know, mainstream representations began to change. And so I started writing at that time almost as a cautionary sort of, you know, measure or kind of like the canary in the coal mine. I started uh, writing sociological papers such as uh, Mick Yoga, The Diet for Spiritual America. I wrote a piece on, you know, yoga celebrity culture. And this is in 2005, 2006, um, very, very early on and thought to myself, wow, this is really interesting. I kind of had my feet straddled on both sides of the fence, if you will, Mm -hmm. before the large corporate takeover, during and and after. And that actually is why I went into such deep action around, you know, representation, inclusivity, diversity, accessibility, because for me, the heart of it always was that deeply personal practice. Uh, The fact that, you know, I had come to the place where I could heal myself to the place where I could come and practice forgiveness, acceptance, and gratitude, and have all the feels and not be taken out, and understood that if everyone 
had access to the practice that it would not only be um, something you know revolutionary for the individual, but that it would be revolutionary for the culture. So I always talk about you know personal transformation for collective liberation. And so I went into action because I was so deeply disturbed by what I saw as barriers to people who needed the practice the most, who would feel left out or who would feel alienated or who felt that they couldn't fit into, you know, certain images or ideas of what it looked like. Because I actually had people who would tell me, because I, you know, probably like you and many others who come to yoga, they want to take everybody to class, right? And people would say, oh, I'll go once I'm a little more flexible. Oh, I'll go blah, blah, blah. And I went, wow, like there are a lot of people who don't feel this is for them. So that, that, that is that piece where I felt like, yes, if we can change it, then hopefully people can come into it from that other avenue, right? Yet at the same time, acknowledging that like you, I really resonated with that deeply physical practice that brought me into, you know, like you said, the more subtle aspects. So I don't think one is right and one is wrong. I think both are currently coexisting. I think one has still a larger megaphone, but I don't think it's necessarily problematic if the the teachings, the rhetoric that goes with it, uh, the way that the teacher teaches is encouraging them to, you know, take a break or to practice moderation or to have the breath be the focal point. What I find to be so problematic about that inroad is that there are enough people who are, quote, teaching who aren't actually teachers and who don't actually have practices and who are not encouraging that and who have really veiled, you know, fitness practices as well as, you know, diet culture under this veil of yoga, which it's not. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And first okay. I'll say, I, I agree with you that these things can coexist. I think the more um, entry points or more funnels into the yoga system we have to to wake people up, the better. So yeah, it's not a one size fits all sort of thing. And for every person who is attracted by the physical practice, there will be someone else who's more attracted to the contemplative practices. Um, so absolutely, I, I think those things do work in concert. But um, to to your point about one having a bigger megaphone and and potential abuse of that power of a strong voice, that is a real that's a real thing. And um, I think especially in the age of social media, when anyone can develop a voice and an influence based on the votes of impressionable people, um, it becomes an even uh, an even bigger point to consider. Well, yeah, especially when, you know, the number of followers and likes somehow, you know, are supposed to equate to some level of credibility Credibility. or to, you know, to understanding which it's not. And that is actually why, you know, one of the reasons, many reasons that I formed the Yoga and Body Image Coalition right around the time that the first book was coming out was, first of all, I wanted to aggregate voices of people who were doing body positive work from a truly you know, intersectionalist framework, one rooted in social justice, grass, grassroots organizing, and who had a a, a, de- a layer of depth to the work, that it wasn't being used as a hashtag or a mantra or a new slogan or buzzword that was in vogue at the time. So I wanted to right. aggregate that, you know, so that we could call more attention to ourselves, which we did. Um, and it's been, you know, a huge uh a huge, huge point of change in, in the conversation. I mean, where we're at in the conversation now is pretty incredible given where we were, you know, just five years ago. But at the same time, I also wanted to have this aggregated mass, not only to, you know, to, for us to have like a joint megaphone, but also because there are so many incredible teachers and practitioners um, doing fantastic work in their communities and serving people who are not landing, you know, advertisements, magazine covers, and who don't have, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of followers that really need to be seen. And so I wanted to create a community platform and opportunities for their voices to be heard, their experiences to be shared. So from you know the the blog itself to our social media to the videos that I've done you know kind of like uh, PSAs around what a yogi looks like to work with Yoga International to the books like I've tried to find as many ways as possible 
for all of these fantastic folks to have greater access to, um, you know, a larger, uh, larger audience, if you will. And the other thing I, I want to say is along with that, um, you know, bestowing some level of credibility to folks who have a certain amount of followers, <clears throat> which may not necessarily actually um, be indicative of their authentic credibility has been deeply problematic to me because I've had conversations with some of those folks or found out that that they're actually quote posers, meaning, you know, not in the sense of the word I maybe used during my punk rock days or something, but posers in the sense that they're just posing. They don't actually have a practice. Uh -huh. They're good at going into these poses because they're very flexible. Again, many of them maybe have had athletic backgrounds, gymnastic backgrounds. Maybe they're conventionally attractive. Uh, you know, they look good in bikinis or without a shirt on or whatever. And so they go into these poses that are eye catching, um, you know, that will create a buzz and, you know, that that's all they're doing. And then they have been asked to teach around the country and have been asked to do videos. And I just the level of, I would say, disservice to people to people, to practitioners, the level of disservice to the practice itself, as well as how deeply problematic it is to have people teaching, you know, at festivals and other large classes where they have not actually had an ongoing long practice themselves mm -hmm. is, is something to take a look at um, because they're the ones who are being asked to you know, headline things like that are the ones who have the followers. They're also the ones being asked primarily to write books on yoga or practices um, from very large publishers because, you know, publishers nowadays primarily are looking for folks who have a certain amount of social media following uh, because they know they can sell books. But right. what's being put out there is not actually being put out by people who have, you know, a depth of practice. I don't even, I'll be honest, I think that, you know, yoga teacher trainings are important, but at the same time, I have no attachment to them because someone can go through a yoga teacher training in, you know, however many days or weekends and, you know, in my eyes still has not had an ongoing practice and probably shouldn't be teaching. Um, so for me, it's more about the depth of someone's practice physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and, uh, that, I don't know, we're, we're diluting the criteria, we're diluting the meaning, we're diluting the possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in a way, you, you could see that it's kind of a short, even from a business, like totally capitalistic perspective, it's a very short-sighted um, kind of way to operate, to, to look, for example, to the, use the example that you gave, to look at someone who has a major following based on their physical poses and ask them to write a book because they can sell it. Well, mm -hmm. what's going to happen after the book sells? You know, the, no one's going to be, if no one is happy with the content, then it's going to reflect poorly on the publisher, reflect poorly on the author, and no future books are going to sell and the credibility drops. So you, although in a lot of times they have ghost writers and other, other people who are then, you know, kind of, I would say hopping on the coattails of that person, but you know, so maybe, maybe even the book, you could get away with that. My thing is even more, what happens when they then go teach, go teach a person? class? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, and, and now a, because a fresh I, perspective is colored by this idea of what yoga practice is. And then, you know, that has a ripple effect. It gets spread out in that way. Yeah. You know, I, I had a conversation with, with someone who I wanted uh, in one of my books who had a large following and in talking to this person, it took me a minute, but I realized I was like, oh, wait a minute, is this person telling me that they don't actually have a practice? And I was so <laughs> like taken aback. I didn't know what to say. I didn't include them in my book, obviously, but I went, it gave me real insight in how often that that's actually happening. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that you just said reminded me of, I've had moments um, where I've been really grateful that, you know, I began my practice when I did. Be and with my own teacher, because, you know, I started my practice in 1996 when, first of all, there weren't a lot of studios at all. There wasn't a lot to pick from. Uh, there was no such thing as yoga culture or even studio culture in the way that we know it now. Um, there weren't a lot of, you know, retail boutiques, let's say, associated with those studios. And 
in my case, no mirrors, you know, uh, just nothing. You know, some people didn't even have yoga mats. Mats were pretty new on the scene at that time. We certainly didn't have yoga clothes. The yoga clothes were the clothes that we bought for yoga. That became yoga clothes. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. I remember being so excited seeing a pair of pants. I was like, oh, these could work for yoga. Here are my yoga pants, right? Mm -hmm. And all of that, there was a certain liberation from, you know, the imagery that we see now. And so I think that's the other part that's compelled me if we're talking about Dharma, right, to do this work is because I feel like I have had the real privilege to have this before and after snapshot on things like before and after, you know, corporate takeover, before and after, you know, the rise of yoga culture and the business of yoga and being able to sort of hold it all, see it all, and I'm definitely not a purist or a traditionalist in any sense of the word, but being able to look at it holistically and seeing like, you know, hey, what works? What maybe doesn't? What might we benefit from changing? Because like you said, I also agree there are many inroads and the more the better. My big thing is making sure that the, the integrity of the practice in terms of the unity, right, of our being and sort of those core components around forgiveness and practice, moderation and practice, listening and practice are preserved. And in my mind, if that's there, then fantastic. You know, that then people can get the lessons that they need, the lessons that will serve them. Um, the big problem is just how often it's just stripped away and it's like an aerobics class or, you know, it's, it's something else entirely uh, different than yoga where the same toxic imagery, the same toxic messages around, you know, um, no pain, no gain or pushing beyond our boundaries and going into performance and objectifying the body are there. That's really, if we could distill it, that's my beef, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, yeah. And I think every listener of this show, every yoga practitioner should ask themselves the same questions. What, what is it about the, this wide breadth of different practices and theories and techniques that makes it yoga for you. You know, for me, it's about compassion and connection, but you know, you, you mentioned self inquiry. There are all these things that can be critical to your practice, but if, as long as you're, I think, you know, to your point, self inquiry, as long as you're asking these questions of yourself, I think that's part of the practice as well. Yeah, it, it is. And, and, and that's what makes it so wonderful is that there are all of these deeply personal components and perspectives and interpretations that I'm all about fostering. You know, the more we can come into the authentic experience and sense of self, the better. Uh, the fascinating thing is on that topic is, in, and maybe even explains why I like to steer away from the word yoga a bit now is I think <laughs> when I think about reality TV and I think about, you know, uh, celebrities uh, or and wannabes and reality TV, it's it's just frighteningly similar to yoga culture in so many ways is there are a lot of uh, young people. Um, and I do say on purpose, primarily young people who see these images and see these folks who are gaining a large following and gaining sponsorship by creating certain images, you know, from their platforms that they see this as another way to become a celebrity. Oh, okay. My acting career, my singing career, my fill in the blank maybe is not as likely, or maybe didn't work out, but I can become a yoga celebrity. Right. And that almost feels like the same thing as like, I can be, you know, a reality TV celebrity that we have this, you know, celebrity culture as large. And um, a lot of people think that what they're going to get out of yoga, yoga practice, and all of those things uh, are just not that starkly different from what we see everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think apart also, you, you mentioned you had this like perspective that came from pre, peri, and post corporate mick yoga that's, that's empowering your dharma. You had so, you had a little jewel of a comment a while back that I want to come back to and just just um, just pair it back to you. Personal transformation um, for collective liberation. Now, if if you are uh, inspiring this collective liberation or a movement toward that through your conversations around body image and um, and and feminism and sociology and all of the ways that these things are intersecting. At some point in your past, there must have been a personal transformation that really drove you to to care about that so much. 
are you are you open to spinning the clock back and and talking about yourself a bit and how you got to that point? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I walked into that sociology of women's class that I mentioned, you know, at the beginning of the interview, that was that moment where all of the horrible things that I thought about myself, believed about myself, all of the toxic and negative things that I allowed and tolerated in my life came into such clear focus. And I always think about the Gloria Steinem quote, you know, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. And that Mm -hmm. was definitely where I was at, uh, at that moment. But I realized that I was not um, the problem. What I realized in that moment is that patriarchy is the problem, you know, the capitalism might be the problem or just that if we look at the larger systems and structures, what we can understand is that we are not individuals unto ourselves doesn't mean that we don't have personal responsibility, of course. I'm a huge advocate for that in the empowerment work that I do. But at that point, I only saw the individual, right? I only saw myself in the context of my life and the world that I was living in. And so when I looked at the negative, bad, sad, traumatic things that I'd experienced, there was always a sense that it was my fault, that I wasn't smart enough, I wasn't attractive enough, I wasn't thin enough, I wasn't witty enough, I wasn't, you know, fill in the blank enough. And when I came to understand systems and institutions, I went, okay, yeah, so I'm an individual, I have, you know, personal agency, but I'm making, you know, to a large degree, because I had been unconscious, I had been making decisions within, you know, the limitations of my culture and my family, my world. And so I felt truly, really liberated by the awareness that, hey, I'm not the issue. There's something larger at work here and I can place myself in this larger context and work on myself. And in doing so, I can create social change and that as I take my newfound sense of agency, as I take my newfound sense of consciousness, and I am taking these new actions, this is not just for me, but that I have the ability to actually, um, you know, enable the collective shift to occur. And that's what lit me up and, and has been, you know, informing my work ever since. So if I think about the hub of my work, whether it's teaching, speaking, writing, you know, community organizing, coaching, all of it relates back to consciousness raising and allowing that raised consciousness to move us into action in the world, not just for ourselves, but for, you know, the greater good. Mm-hmm. Yes, that that is such an admirable perspective to take on that because, you know, you could, you could look at um, that moment, that epiphany and say, oh, well, if it's outside of my individuality, then I'm helpless and I'm just going to wallow and be a victim here. But rather, instead of that, you said, well, actually, this is more empowering than ever because I have the ability not only to change my own outcome, but also that of other people and and be of service in that way. So um, that's great. I love that. Thank you. And, and, and I will say that, you know, it wasn't just the information that I was learning when I first walked into that class, but it was my mentor herself, just being in that mentor mentee relationship, right. And having someone support and guide me. Um, I knew at that moment, not only did I want to do this work, but that I wanted to be in the mentor mentee relationship my whole life, that the way that she helps support me in, uh, you know, my liberation, the way that my yoga teachers have helped support me. um, I wanted to be on the giving and receiving end of that my whole life, because there's something that is so magical, so profound about being the teacher, the learner, about being the mentor, being the mentee, um, because I, I knew the power of what that experience held. I knew the power of my practice. I knew the power of merging the intellectual and the embodied awareness into one that I couldn't help. I was like, want to share this with everyone. I want, I wanted everyone to have the possibility of their own version of that to happen. I know we're running short on time. So I'd love to hear maybe just one of the many things that you're doing, um, coming up apart from writing embodied resilience, 
to to further that mission? What's something that you're excited about working on right now, whether it's the Body Image Coalition or the Joy Revolution or something that we haven't spoken about yet? Um, you know, I'm, I want to mention the Joy Revolution because I've mentioned the other things, you know, quite at length. And in many ways, the Joy Revolution is the most recent incarnation, <laughs> if you will, of all of this work that I've been doing. Um, and that was uh, when I met my partner, Mark Cordone, in this work. Um, we both had long histories of social justice work and community organizing. He had been at multicultural affairs at Emory University. And, you know, there were so many intersections that we had. And in our conversation, we also talked about the burnout that can oftentimes come from doing this kind of work. And we were really looking at, um, well, we were looking at it through the lens of positive psychology, which is his background. How can this become more sustainable? How can we have this be more sustainable, not just for ourselves, but for the movement as a whole? And so uh, we created the joy revolution because in positive psychology, we look at how can we really flourish, not settle, not just strive, but really flourish and expand and empower in a way that is going to go the full distance. How can we also transmute sometimes our righteous rage and our anger that catalyzes us into action? How can we transmute that into joy and increase our joy capacity so that we ha are really operating at, you know, sort of the optimal level, um, how we have enough self-care, how we can reach others. And so we put that all together in this particular program and uh, our forthcoming podcast because we realize that oftentimes people will start this work, especially when it's rooted in social justice, but get burnt out. Or there will be divisions, not only among factions, but within movements. And we wanted to really um, maximize the potential for everyone to create long lasting social change by merging our backgrounds in social justice and feminism and mindfulness and embodiment, you know, in a way that people could look at this in a new way, um, that they could be really go into not just branding and not just, you know, sort of their personal work, but how can paradigm shifts happen that are infused on the foundation of joy? Beautiful. And for any listeners who might be right in, in the middle of that, feeling the strain or the burnout from activism, how can they learn more about getting involved with the program? Yeah, they can go uh, look us up on social media. I personally am at Mel Mel Klein, uh, also at the Joy Rev, and then the joyrevolution.org. So I'm all over the internet, whether they're looking for the Yoga and Body <laughs> Image Coalition or the Joy Revolution. Um, yeah, just go ahead, look me up primarily on Instagram or the websites. And uh, yeah, reach out. Happy to connect people, provide resources tell them more. Um, really, this to me has been uh, an exciting part of my work is that with this particular program, what we've been doing in the last year has taken everything that I've done and added a new twist that is incredibly exciting for me. And for the people who've gone through the program that we've worked with, it's just seeing how what they've already been doing has been enhanced and there's been new nuances and there have been new layers and seeing the I would say the level of, yeah, the joy capacity for them increasing where there is greater equanimity and balance and, you know, just a, a real sense of awareness around what becomes possible um, in terms of for us as individuals and us as a collective. And it's, it's, it's profound. It's wonderful. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Of course. I, I'm all about increasing the capacity for joy, equanimity, and, and all of those things. So let's finish up the interview with the final round. This is, we're going to have a little fun mm -hmm. here. This is the prana round. I'm going to ask you six rapid fire questions and ask you to answer oh in minimum one word, maximum one sentence. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, I'm like, you think I can answer in one word. Okay. We'll try. <laughs> <laughs> let's go for it. All right. In one word, why do you practice yoga? Peace. What's your favorite yoga pose and why? child's pose uh because it allows me to i feel like i'm fully connected with myself and that's like where you had pod. your major breakthrough too mm -hmm. yep what is the single best cue or piece of advice that you've ever received from a yoga teacher 
not to compare or compete with myself or anyone else. Recommend one book, obviously, apart from Yoga and Body Image, Yoga Rising, and your forthcoming Embodied Resilience for our <laughs> audience, because those are all recommended already. Oh, my goodness. Um, that is so hard. I have so many hundreds and hundreds of books. Um, I would say anything by Pima Chodron. Okay. Maybe the places that scare you. There you go. Nice. I just um, I just listened to the audio version of um, When Things Fall Apart. Oh, beautiful. Love that. Is yoga for everyone? Yes. I thought you would answer that way. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, my friend Diane Bondi, her new book just came out, which is yoga for everybody. All right. Um, last question. You you mentioned them already, but how can our audience get in touch with you and how can we support you in our dharma, in your dharma? Yeah, is visit the website, which I will send you for the show notes, but it's ybicoalition.com, thejoyrevolution.org. Um, and what I would say is share out the information with anyone who thinks they could they may benefit or could use it and feel free to reach out and share your story because I'm all about also creating the opportunity to spread the message by sharing the stories and the insights of others. Okay. It has been such a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I got a lot out of this conversation and I, I sure hope that the Dharma talk community did as well. I'm sure they did. So thank you for giving a little bit of your time to me and the listeners today. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Henry. I appreciate you as well. Hey, Dharma Talk community. If you enjoyed this podcast and you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button right now. And if you'd like to show your support even more, leave me an honest review on iTunes or whatever podcast directory you listen on. You can also make a financial contribution to keep the show up and running, a donation at henrywins.com. And remember, I'm here to serve you. So if you have any questions or comments or ideas, you can always reach me on Instagram at Henry Wins. Otherwise, I'll speak to you next week. Keep living your dharma.